In the cold, still waters of Hval Fjord, merchant ships anchored silently. Each proudly displayed its name written large on the side opposite the bridge. The scene most resembled preparations for a strange regatta to be held at the foot of the snow-covered hills surrounding the fjord. A tense expectation hung in the air. Suddenly the peaceful calm of a June day was split by the flash of a searchlight. One of the American ships was transmitting an urgent message. The signal from the Christopher Newport was received aboard the American battleship Washington. Immediately a boat was launched and a group of marines rushed to suppress the suddenly erupted on board the transport mutiny. But it quickly became clear that the crew had simply reached a shipment of whiskey addressed to Admiral Stanley, the American ambassador to Moscow. Events got out of hand, but the marines quickly restored order. This comic incident was the first fight of the PQ-17 convoy. At the same time, however, it was one of many symptoms of the deep frustration that gripped the sailors who had travelled a long way across the Atlantic and found themselves trapped in Haval Fjord for weeks, waiting for PQ-17 to leave. Two-thirds of the convoy was made up of American ships. Aboard these 24 transports were many cargoes bound from the United States to Russia. Let's see what kind of ships were gathered here. This was the Alcoa Ranger out of Philadelphia which had 7,000 tons of various cargoes on board, steel, armour plates, flour. There were 19 tanks on the deck of the transport. Washington and Honomu, assigned to the same port, were loaded with ammunition, steel, food, explosives. Tanks and trucks were also on their decks. Tanks were also on the Daniel Morgan out of Baltimore. Similar cargoes were on the rest of the transports. They were all sitting in the water very deep. Probably the transports had never been loaded like this before. Most of the transports were by no means new ships, and their names said little. The older Exford and Hoosier had been built in Pennsylvania shipyards more than 20 years ago, and had already left many thousands of miles behind them. The ironclad was so old and rusty that the sailors were always wondering if the Germans would waste a torpedo on this wreck. Four transports bore the proud names of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence, the Samuel Chase, John Witherspoon, William Hooper, and Benjamin Harrison. However, all of these ships were ugly ducks in the convoy, bulky and slow-moving Liberty-type transports that were stamped out by the Henry Kaiser shipyards by the dozens. They were assembled from individual sections using welding rather than traditional rivets. Sailors who sailed on Liberty transports didn't like them. The rigid construction constantly threatened to break in heavy waves, even though these were the ships that played a crucial role during the Battle of the Atlantic. But not all American ships had American crews. For example, the El Capitan, assigned to New York, carried the Panamanian flag. Of the entire crew, only ten of the gunnery crew were Americans. El Capitan arrived at Valfjord during the last week of May, as did most other transit ports. The long wait after crossing the Atlantic had become almost unbearable for the sailors of merchant ships. It led to low spirits, especially because the crews had to stay on board all the time. They were forbidden to visit Reykjavik, whose lights shone enticingly not so far away. It is not surprising, therefore, that Admiral Stanley lost some of his whisky. Some of the ships made a very long journey, like the Peter Kerr, which left Portland, Oregon, on the Pacific coast. The crew, including second mate William Connolly, boarded the transport at a shipyard in New York City. There, some armament was installed on the aging ship. The holds of the Peter Kerr were filled mostly with food, on the deck were loaded with tanks and airplanes. Everyone knew exactly where the ship was headed, as additional steam radiators had been installed in each compartment. This was a sure sign that there was a trip to northern Russia to be made. Peter Kerr left New York on Easter Sunday 1942 and headed alone for Halifax, Nova Scotia. There it joined one of the North Atlantic convoys and arrived at Firth of Clyde. The transport then crossed to Loch U on the west coast of Scotland and with a small convoy went out to Iceland. That's how it got to Val Fjord, 
where the crew had to spend 23 days on the ship until PQ-17 put to sea. One of the reasons Connolly and his comrades were forbidden to go ashore turned out to be more than strange. It turned out that the sailors liked to toss Ida eggs while on leave. Since these eggs were an important food resource in desert Iceland, its inhabitants did not want to allow the squandering of a valuable product. Whether true or not, any American sailor coming ashore felt uncomfortable. The Icelanders let them know at once that they were not welcome here. Until recently they had been downright hostile. To walk alone in the dark was to run a serious risk of being beaten at any moment with empty bottles or sticks. Now the Icelanders' attitude had softened to one of passive resistance, but still one should not turn one's back on them. This more than cold reception was particularly unpleasant when it came to women. The fact that the male Icelanders completely ignored the presence of the American sailors didn't bother the latter too much, but the fact that the Icelandic girls, who were distinguished by their beautiful blonde hair, which went down almost to their heels, looked at the Americans as if they were nothing, hurt the sailors' pride. Tall, slender, pretty girls avoided meeting a glance with strangers. In stores, cafes and hotels, the servants were coldly polite, immediately turning into arctic ice at the slightest hint of familiarity. Terrific blondes, yet they've never even seen a real guy, was the sailors' opinion. The Icelanders were exceptionally unfriendly to the Americans. Occasional accidents did not improve relations, especially when American sentries opened fire on locals, including children. The Icelanders' attempts to obtain liquor led to a smuggling trade in Reykjavik harbour, causing more clashes and even shootouts between Americans and Icelandic police. A bottle of rum was the only pass to Iceland, although local prostitutes drove up to the harbour in cabs, luring the woman-hungry sailors. The Icelanders showed not the slightest gratitude for the prosperity the occupiers had brought to their island. The sailors were surprised by this attitude, especially when they saw the brightly lit streets of Reykjavik filled with American cars, huge storefronts bursting with American goods and women flaunting American dresses. Even visits to the dock had to be cut to the limit because of the high fees demanded by the Icelanders, and ships were hanging around in the roadstead. This is what Valfjord looked like. British sailors never referred to it as a place even worse than Scarpa Flow. Yet that is exactly what it was. Valfjord was an isolated anchorage, over which storms often blew over and pulled ships off their anchors. It was terribly cold in the winter, and in the summer it was just plain cold. There was nothing to do ashore. There was only one shack, called a bar, where strong Canadian beer was served and fights broke out almost every night. The American sailors from the PQ-17 convoy ships had little to lose by not being ashore, although it didn't seem that way to them, trapped on their ships. It was especially bad in the mornings when the sun painted the snow-capped mountaintops a delicate pink and the colourful Icelandic fishing boats put out to sea. They seemed completely unconcerned about the war with Hitler. In addition to the American, the convoy consisted of eight British merchant ships, one Dutch and two Russian tankers. They arrived at Val Fjord later than the Americans, so their wait was not as long and languid. Typical of them was the Earlston, a dry cargo ship built only a year before. Its cargo consisted of field guns, trucks, hurricane fighters and hundreds of tonnes of ammunition. On deck, barrels held aviation gasoline and toluene. There too, just in front of the bridge, was firmly nailed to a steamboat destined for the British naval mission in Arkhangelsk. The British vessels were as heavily laden as the American ones. One of them, the Empire Tide, was armed with a fighter catapult. This hurricane could only take off once, after which the pilot had to either land his plane on the water next to the ship or parachute in, hoping to be pulled out of the icy sea in time. The Empire Tide differed from other transports in profile. In addition to the catapult, anti-aircraft guns and balloon, this ship was equipped with radar, which was a great advantage. Despite attempts to maintain secrecy, everyone knew exactly where the ship was headed, even as it loaded at Newport. Many of the crates were clearly labelled to Admiral Dolinin, Arkhangelsk. Such was the secrecy. 
In addition to the Empire Tide, Radar had a new British ship, Ocean Freedom, built in South Portland, Massachusetts. Like all Liberty-type transports, this was half-welded. Freedom made its first crossing of the Atlantic with a cargo of steel plates, and in England it loaded tanks, Bren armoured personnel carriers and other equipment for the Russians. The ship then led a small convoy from Loch Yu to Hval Fjord, and its captain, William Walker, became Commodore of that convoy. During the crossing, the Freedom was in combat for the first time. At the time, airplanes were forbidden to approach convoy ships in fog, but one American pilot violated this prohibition. Freedom and Earlston quickly shot it down, mistaking it for a Fokker Wolf. The crew of the plane was picked up, and Captain Walker was ordered to forget about the incident, and henceforth do not allow his gunners to shoot at anything. The Earlston's armament was typical of merchant ships. She had twin Browning machine guns on the Monkey Island, the platform above the bridge, two Ehrlichons on the bridge wings, two on the aft end of the boat deck, and two more just forward of the gunwale. A rocket launcher on the David deck could also be used against aircraft. The old 100mm gun was intended for anti-submarine warfare. Some ships had more powerful armament, some less so. All had artillery crews of up to 12 men. Sometimes British gunners were stationed on American ships, as on the Olipan, but more often the Americans used their own gunners. The Dutch transport Paulus Potter carried British gunners. On part of the transport's armament was installed in a terrible hurry. Exford had to be delayed at Loch U, so that two Marine and two Royal Navy gunners could arrive in time. They had to service the machine guns, which were still stored in crates for the time being. Things were no better on the mutinous Christopher Newport. When Leet Daniel Jones of the battleship Washington visited his friend in the artillery crew, he was surprised to see a fossilised 100mm gun at the stern that had formerly stood in Baltimore Park. Its rifling had been practically obliterated, and its elevation angle did not exceed 25 degrees. Littie Jones, seeing all this armament and the meagre supply of shells with which the ship had to defend herself, left with a heavy heart. He remained firmly convinced that the new port was doomed to destruction, and only a miracle could save her. Few of the American captains were familiar with the sea and weather that awaited them. Among such was Julius Holmgren, skipper of the Hoosier, who left his farm in Maine to answer the call of his adopted country. He was born in Stockholm and came to America as a young lad. Now, in his late seventies, he returned to northern waters once again. Among the British skippers with Arctic sailing experience was Captain Stenvik of the Earlston, a Norwegian baron who had been granted British citizenship. The crews of the American ships were not totally unfamiliar with Norwegian waters, but most of the sailors were, after all, from inland states far from the sea at all. For some, it was their first voyage. There were young, inexperienced lads like these among the British sailors. But next to them were the salt-of-the-earth veterans. They looked at everything with the cold fatalism of men who were no strangers to trekking through enemy waters. The boys and men on the escort ships also had to stick around in Havalfjord. There were seven warships there, three minesweepers and four ASW trawlers, which was a third of the escort ships. We did not expect to hold the enemy with our own forces, but other escort ships were to join the convoy after it rounded Iceland. Sailors of transports with a displacement of more than 10,000 tonnes hardly recognised such minesweepers as the Salamander, with a displacement of only 850 tonnes as warships. Even less reassuring were the tiny trawlers, which had a speed of no more than 10 knots. Ironically, one of the trawlers, the Nofen Gem, was built in Bremerhaven, Germany. It was one of the fishing vessels given to Great Britain as reparations after World War I. The trawler was faster and sturdier built than similar British vessels like the Lord Austin. Our trawler looked exactly like what it was, an ocean fishing trawler with a high bow and a low side, over which the waves were constantly rolling. Its usual black and brown colours had been replaced by white and blue Admiralty camouflage that allowed it to disappear against the ice-covered sea. The armament of the merchant ships had been assembled from scratch, but our situation was no better. 
we had a 102mm gun and Ehrlichon behind the bridge, and a twin 12.7mm machine gun on the stern platform. Rounding out the kit were two Gochkis machine guns on the bridge wings. Two bombometers were mounted on the deck on either side of the bridge. When we fired a bomb, the stern of the Austin would rise up and shudder. The most terrific of the devices was the Holman thrower. It was a stove-like pipe that connected to the main steam line. To fire it, the steam pressure had to be raised. Then the sailor put a cylinder with a loosely soldered cap into the pipe. Inside the cylinder was a hand grenade. It was supposed that when the plane started to dive on the trawler, the vapour pressure would throw the cylinder towards it. The lid would bounce off and the grenade would fly out of the cylinder with the handle cocked. If the plane is in the right place at the right time, it will get its share of shrapnel. No one managed to see an airplane shot down in this way, but grenades quite often fell back to the ship and exploded right under its side. The crew of the trawler nicknamed Holman's thrower the Hot Potato Cart. Our ships threw potatoes at each other for fun. It was the safest way to use such an invention. The core of trawler crews consisted of experienced sailors and fishermen, although, as on merchant ships, there were enough newcomers. On the No Fern Gem, for example, more than two-thirds of the crew were boys who had never been to sea, or even seen it at all, before they came to us. So far, the Lord Austin had only had to contend with stormy seas, cold and soul-wrenching monotony. Long months in the Northern Patrol, long weeks in Iceland, fogs and icing, we'd had enough of that, but never once had we seen or heard the enemy. But now the prospect of meeting him face to face, of being in a real battle, horrible and bloody, seemed quite real. We heard breathtaking stories about the adventures of the PQ-16 convoy. Seven ships were lost. Will our campaign be as terrible, or are all these stories full of exaggerations? How will each of us stand up to the ordeal? What will it really be like? Will we survive? Suddenly, the long wait came to an end. The cruiser London reappeared in Val Fjord. She had come here before and had been the scene of a captain's meeting. Its huge hull literally overwhelmed the transports, and trawlers against the background of the cruiser in general seemed like children's toys. On the London was raised the flag of Rear Admiral L.C.G. Hamilton, who commanded the Anglo-American cruiser squadron. She was to escort us to Medvegi Island. During the long period of waiting, the London had been drifting back and forth between Sadis Fjord, Hval Fjord and Akureyri like a huge babysitter. Now it had returned once more, and a final meeting was to be held in a hut on the shore. Earlier, the artillery crews and some of the officers had received a description of the stratagems used by the Germans in the Arctic. Submarines pursuing the convoy could take cover under the ice to avoid detection by ASDIC and attack by depth bombs. They could lurk near an iceberg, in which case the white and blue camouflage made it very difficult to detect the boat. The skippers of the merchant ships and officers were now to be given a description of the route and actions of the convoy. It was with great surprise that we saw at the meeting a Russian woman officer from the tanker Azerbaijan who was travelling with us. The commanders of the escort ships returned from the meeting in good spirits. One of them said to the crew of his dinghy which brought him ashore, We intend to crush their boats and we will spread the captured bastards on deck and drown them alive. Silly old runt, I'd rather skin him alive, muttered one of the sailors. But the general mood was upbeat. One of the main speakers at the meeting was Captain Second Rank J. E. Broom, who on the destroyer Keppel was to lead the direct escort of the convoy. He too spoke extremely optimistic. In his opinion, the Germans are not too willing to attack convoys with such a strong escort, a total of 21 ships. His destroyer spent some time at CA, practicing actions in case of the appearance of enemy surface ships. He was quite confident that smoke screens and torpedoes would deter the Germans. Captain Second Rank Broom was an experienced officer who had escorted many convoys. He was 40 years old and a true sea wolf. On board ship, he, according to his crew, resembled an old toothless dog, dapper without a cap, and wore a tight sweater. On shore, however, he put in his dentures and dashingly clapped on his cap in the style of Admiral Beatty. 
Everyone respected him for his determination and the way he ran his ship. He enjoyed unprecedented affection from the sailors of the Keppel. The Commodore of the convoy on the British ship River Afton, Commodore John Dowding, was a similarly experienced sailor. He was in his late fifties and had spent his entire life at sea. During the First World War, Dowding served on cruisers and destroyers, and then almost twenty years sailed on the ships of the company Orient Line. He was completely confident and tried to instill this in all the sailors and skippers of the convoy. They were impressed by Dowding's words when he addressed them as your Commodore for this campaign. The confidence of success felt by these two commanders lifted the sailors' spirits. The same tactics were to be used as during the PQ-16 escort. Merchant ships, together with minesweepers and trawlers, will go along the west coast of Iceland and turn to the northeast, then meet with the escort ships, which will lead from Sadisfjord Keppel. The convoy will then have a long passage past Medveji Island into the Barents Sea. The cruising squadron, which consisted of the London and Norfolk, as well as the American cruisers Wichita and Tuscaloosa and three destroyers, would guard the convoy from surface ship attacks until Bear Island. They could handle any threat unless the Tirpitz showed up. But in any case, the cruisers will not go further than Medveji Island or the meridian of Cape Nordcap. From that moment, the safety of the convoy should provide escort ships together with British and Russian submarines operating in the area. On the first leg of the route, even farther behind, was to be a powerful formation that would cruise between Scarpa Flow and Spitsbergen. It was commanded by Admiral Tovey, Commander-in-Chief of the Metropolitan Fleet, who held the flag on the battleship Duke of York. The formation consisted of the US battleship Washington, the aircraft carrier Victorious, two cruisers and 14 destroyers. They were to patrol west of Medveji Island and cover the convoy from attacks in the area. The entire operation was under the direction of Admiral Tovey. So, in the afternoon of June 27th, convoy PQ-17 moved on its historic voyage. The sun shone in the gloomy Icelandic sky. Craggy mountains surrounded Valfjord, and it all looked very much like a tourist prospectus. Our little ships circled the bay, waiting their turn. We had to wait until the last of the clumsy merchants had left the fjord. One by one, the heavily laden transports slowly sailed past us and lined up in a long column in the open sea. This process took several hours. Thirty-three transports, two Russian tankers, two auxiliary tankers of the British fleet, Grey Ranger and Aldersdale. They were fitted with false pipes to make the tankers resemble ordinary transports. One by one, the escort ships finally left the fjord to take their places in the order. Lord Austin was to be on the right rear of the convoy, and we were the last to put to sea. As we looked back to see the other vessels left anchored in this dismal fjord, some involuntarily muttered, Thank God we're stuck out there with those poor bastards. But weren't the sailors of PQ-16 saying the same thing? Now it was our turn. Just as the Austin passed the throat of the fjord, it collided with an ocean wave. The wind picked up and our little ship began to churn. The sun disappeared and a grey haze enveloped us. It was getting a little cold. In the meantime, the London had arrived at Sadis Fjord, where the rest of the escort ships were preparing to leave. Foremost among them were the two air defence ships Palomares and Pozarica. They were not real warships, but converted merchant ships, former banana carriers, which in peacetime were designed to carry cargo and a small number of passengers. They were now fitted with thousands of tons of armour and many guns, twin 102 millimeters guns and four-barrel pom-poms. Later, the ships also carried light anti-aircraft guns. Pozarica was so loaded that some of the shells had to be stored on deck. On deck. Yes, the journey was not a dull one. There were arguments in the Pozarica's quarters. For the last year, the ship had been escorting convoys on the western approaches, and where would she go now? To Malta or to Russia? And which was the lesser of two evils? The passage to Malta was not so long. There you could meet fierce enemy opposition, especially from the air, but you could count on the help of your aircraft carriers. 
After leaving Gibraltar, the convoy was almost constantly under attack, but if you have to swim, the water is relatively warm and the shore is relatively close. On the Russian route, everything was the opposite. A long voyage in deserted waters, no aircraft carriers or air cover, and very little chance of rescue if you hit icy water. Not a very cheery outlook. The escort consisted of four corvettes, two of which had just been built and were making their maiden voyage. In addition to these, there were six destroyers, commanded by Captain Second Rank Broom, who was on the Keppel. Among them was the veteran Fury, which had already made two voyages to Russia, but all these ships were small and old, either destroyers from the First World War or escort destroyers of the Hunt type. The only exception was the new Offer Destroyer Squadron. The Keppel itself was leaking like a sieve, its steam lines mottled with patches but even among these ships stood out an old American four to be built during the last war. It was the EDUC Leamington, formerly the USS Twix. A clumsy ship with a lot of top weight, poorly steered, especially in fresh weather, it was one of 50 such ships the Royal Navy had received in America in exchange for bases. All in all, a jolly bunch of old warships and converted peddlers. Nevertheless, these ships, along with two submarines, as well as minesweepers and trawlers, could put up serious resistance to any enemy. A nice, albeit somewhat grim addition, were the three tail charlies, rescue vessels. They were to follow behind the convoy and pick up the crews of the sunken ships. Rathlin, Zafaran and Zamalek had a displacement of about 1,500 tonnes and before the war did not make crossings longer than two days running between the east coast of England and the continent, or travelling from Glasgow to London. They were now armed, and large infirmaries with numerous medical personnel were arranged for them. They were to make a long voyage in the murky polar waters, but the little Rathlin used to carry cattle and general cargoes from Scotland to Ireland and no farther. Now it, like the others, was getting its teeth. A 102 milliperos gun was mounted on the tank and the thin barrels of the Beauforts were raised aft. On the bridge and deck stood Ehrlichons. The flag of a Navy auxiliary vessel flew proudly at the stern. The holds of all three rescue vessels were filled with empty barrels to increase buoyancy. Farewell words were said, captains turned to their crews. Everyone was firmly impressed. The convoy must pass. The duty of the escort ships is to protect the transports entrusted to them to the end. On the afternoon of Monday, June 29, 1942, the escort ships, led by a submarine, left Sadis Fjord. They passed the huge carcass of the standing guard London and set a course northward to join us. On the same day, Compound X left Scarpa Flow. This was a false convoy of nine assorted coal carriers and minesweepers escorted by two cruisers and five destroyers. It was to divert the enemy's attention from PQ-17. That was the final chord of the Admiralty plan. The observer on the bridge is purring softly to himself. His round red face is barely visible under the hood of his Zuid Vestka, several scarves and a knit cap. The jagged line of the Icelandic coastline looms vaguely to starboard. The convoy is heading north, fighting a large wave, a seal-like submarine swaying a long distance astern of us. Keep a better eye on your child, flashed a searchlight at the commander of the minesweepers as he passed us. The submarine is specially entrusted to the care of the Lord Austin. We must keep a vigilant eye on her, especially when the weather deteriorates. If we get caught in a fog, which is more than likely on this leg of the journey, the ships could easily become separated from each other. And while a huge merchant ship is not too difficult to spot, a submarine is very difficult to see. Besides, the order to maintain strict radio silence has gone into effect. The submarine that has surfaced looks very small and helpless compared to the rest of the convoy, but it has a poisonous sting and she will not hesitate to put it in motion if the German ships appear. All the first day at sea, the convoy went at a speed of seven knots, so as not to lag behind the slowest ships. 
Immediately after leaving Val Fjord, we met a strong wave, grey clouds and terrible cold. It was especially hard on our baby. The merchant ships were rocking and nose-diving, and the sailors were curiously watching the two big Russian tankers, Azerbaijan and Donbass, marvelling at the number of women they had on board. Quite quickly we suffered our first losses. Almost immediately after leaving the harbour, the American vessel Richard Bland ran aground, crossing the Atlantic just for that. The rest of the ships moved northward with extreme caution as there was a passage only four miles wide between the shore and the Allied minefield. The escort ships could not decide what was more dangerous, to fly out on the coastal rocks or to blow up on a mine. All the second day of the campaign, the convoy crawled along the coast, constantly caught in bands of rain and snow. Watching the dreary shores, we wondered how many fascist agents were now frantically tuning their transmitters to report the convoy's departure. There were rumours that enemy agents were scattered literally all along the coast to gather information about Russian convoys. The fumes of transports and trawlers, going on coal, rose into the sky-high black columns. This gave rise to new fears. After all, enemy reconnaissance planes will be very easy to detect us. According to calculations, this was to happen on the fourth day. No firm gem was on the right shell of the convoy. Our main calibre consisted of an old 102mm gun from the First World War. The gunners were diligently cleaning and oiling it, blowing the tiniest specks of dust off the site. On other ships, gunners were doing the same thing. On the third day, a fog crept in, which lasted until evening. A thick, dark and cold fog arrived in company with heavy rain, making the night watch a nightmare and the work of the observers a torment. Later we would long for the fog, even pray for it to come, but now we thought otherwise. As the ocean freedom was creeping slowly along the shore, listening carefully for the sound of a siren, the silhouette of a vessel suddenly emerged from the mist just off the starboard bow. The transport swerved to avoid the collision, and the ocean freedom came literally right up to the salamander's minesweeper, nearly stripping the paint from its sides. When the bridges of the ships were level, the minesweeper asked irritably, Where the hell are you going? Captain Walker replied just as nervously, To Russia, I hope. We didn't realize that Compound X, the decoy convoy, was also caught in the fog. It completely sheltered the decoy from German spy planes. Therefore, all attempts by Compound X to divert German attention to itself were useless. In the fog, we got into a zone of floating ice. Although the forefronts of transports were specially reinforced, that their skippers sometimes wondered whether the board would hold or not, if a particularly large ice floe with a terrible rumble hit the hull of the ship. There was no possibility of dodging the ice floes, as the visibility was too poor and the distance between the ships too small. Therefore, when we were rounding the northern tip of Iceland, we lost the second transport. Exford hit an ice floe. It happened at 4.20 p.m., the stoker Lionel Smith had just changed his watch and was drinking coffee when he felt the whole ship shudder. Immediately afterward, the command, stop, was heard, followed by full reverse, and then stop again. As no explanation was received from the bridge over the intercom, Smith was sent to find out what had happened. The fog was very thick, and the only thing that could be heard was the whistles of vessels moving farther away. Going to the tank, Smith saw the captain and mate bent over the bulwark. He too looked down and saw that the export had struck an ice floe protruding only five feet out of the water. However, it had rolled up the forepeak and pierced the side in the forepeak area. It was clear that the vessel had to return to Val Fjord for repairs. The bosun of the export wanted the vessel to go on, though he himself knew it was impossible. Smith said to him thoughtfully, and maybe we're even lucky. They had always called the Exford a lucky pile of junk, but how lucky they were the sailors found out later in Iceland, when the ship was undergoing repairs. The skipper of the Exford suddenly decided to break radio silence and reported to the Reefer Afton. To the Commodore, my foretop is damaged by ice, your instructions. Of course, he received no reply from Dowding and repeated his request eight times, terrifying the entire convoy. 
only then did the ex Ford return to Fjord. On June 30th, the fourth day of the voyage, we were already north of Iceland and reached the point where we were to meet the escort ships coming out of Sadisfjord. They appeared at about noon, six destroyers, another submarine, four corvettes and two air defense ships, the Palomares and the Pozarica. In their camouflage they looked rather odd, resembling painted boards with no width at all. However, upon closer inspection, their numerous anti-aircraft guns commanded respect. This was a navy. Together with the minesweepers and trawlers, it was the most powerful escort any convoy had ever had. Newly arrived ships at the meeting with merchant ships through loudspeakers played marches. The crews of the transports shouted with joy, sailors waved scarves and hats, danced on deck. All at once they were confident, even perhaps cocky. So many ships, so many warships. Hitler will never be able to stop them. All at once everyone became twice as brave. Over the waves came the loud cries of the American crews. Now they saw with their own eyes that the British Navy knows how to do its job. The destroyers and corvettes quickly took their places on the flanks of the convoy. Trawlers were positioned ahead and behind both columns of warships. Palomares went to the right of the convoy, and Pozarica on the left. This allowed the air defence ships to take under their protection the entire formation, which was now nine miles long and five miles wide. Three rescue ships took up positions on the traverses and behind the convoy. We on the Lord Austin lost our little one, which, with another submarine, had taken shelter in the centre of the formation. We moved forward to take up a position on the right cramble of the convoy. We continued stubbornly forward now and then, getting into creeping streaks of fog. By chance we lost sight of the convoy for several hours, and only regained contact with it when the fog temporarily thinned. For the time being, all our duties in guarding the convoy consisted in keeping constant watch at the guns. But it was more than cold to be on the open gun platform. Very often you could see artillery men wrapped up to their eyebrows pulling themselves up on the barrel of a 102mm gun, as if on a tourniquet or starting to dance with each other, doing foxtrot figures around the gun. Suddenly there is a joyous shout, RUM! This is followed by the appearance of another wrapped figure carrying mugs. A life-giving aroma wafts from them. The watch quickly empties the mugs and fire rolls through all the veins. Never has rum seemed so pleasant. The trawler's main duty was to conduct hydroacoustic searches for German submarines. ASDIC is a bit like underwater radar. All day and all night it sends pulses into the water. Ding, ding. A few seconds later, the signal echoes from the seafloor. An experienced operator will immediately determine whether the bottom is sandy or rocky. When the beam hits some underwater object, the interval between calls indicates the distance to this object. The bearing can also be determined. The operator can easily distinguish a school of fish from a submarine. 4. Long hours operator Astic sits in a chair in the deck house, listening carefully to the calls. They say the operators often go crazy. If a submarine is detected, we should start dropping depth charges until a destroyer comes to the rescue. A slow-moving trawler in the meantime is exposed to two dangers. Until she's up to full speed, the depth charges can explode right under her stern, and if the commander is too keen on chasing the boat, he may not be able to catch up with the convoy. Another task of the trawlers was to drive up the trailing transports and warn them not to smoke too much. The skippers usually responded to such requests quite colourfully, but the most common response was, if we start burning more coal to gain speed, we'll get too much smoke. So what the hell do you want us to do? Do you want us to flap our wings and fly? Usually too much smoke meant that the stokers were working carelessly or were lazy in general. They threw too much coal into the furnace instead of feeding the right amount at the right time, then sat back and watched the wheels spin. Lord Austin was also reprimanded for this by the commanding officer. Our chimney was suddenly full of smoke, spreading in a braided mane over the stern, as sometimes happens to trawlers. From the keppel irritatedly flashed, 
less smoke. A reprimand was then passed from the bridge to the engine room. In reply, the chief mechanic angrily threw in. Well, what do those bastards want me to do? For me to scrub their filthy coal? For the signalman, the peace that reigned in these waters was occasionally interrupted by flashes of Oldys's signal lamps, by which the escort ships exchanged messages. The destroyers constantly guarded the moment of the submarine's appearance, but all this was a familiar, though tedious, routine. The constant shortage of escort ships meant that they had to escort one convoy or another, either to North Russia or Malta. The crews did their jobs with a sullen fatalism, losing comrades to enemy submarine and airplane strikes. A typical signal for a bridge watch was, course so-and-so, speed so-and-so, take up a position 2,000 yards off the left crambo at so-and-so, I am following a zigzag of 20 degrees to either side of the general course. On the opposite flank of the convoy, two ships disappeared about two hours ago. Someone dropped a series of depth charges. Otherwise, no incidents. Damn cold, but that's the usual. The marching routine continued. Let's see what it looked like on the escort destroyer Wilton. The ship's commander practically lived on the bridge as he could not rely entirely on his young, inexperienced officers. Although he himself was only three or four years older, he had the experience of two years of war under his belt. He slept, if he could, in a chair right on the bridge. Although the bridge was open and blown about by all winds, it was possible to find a relatively quiet place at the front of the bridge. Only occasionally could the captain enjoy the luxury of resting in his camping cabin one deck below, this happened when visibility was excellent and no events were imminent. The captain was therefore terribly tired and quite often became angry, but the officers patiently endured his outbursts. They too spent long hours on watch and were also in great need of rest and sleep. No one undressed. Events could unfold too rapidly, so they dozed as best they could in their quarters. Such sleep rarely lasted more than a couple of hours. It was the same on the other ships of the convoy. All our thoughts were occupied with rather simple desires, to sleep, to eat well and to stay alive. So far, the alarm bells have been silent, but how long would this peaceful voyage last? The next morning, July 1st, the first submarine was sighted. It was on the surface and destroyers immediately drove it away. Everyone realised that we would not have to wait long and soon the first enemy scout, or herring as we called them, really appeared. There was a light haze through which the rays of the sun hardly penetrated. Alarm bells rang as soon as the black silhouette of a three-engine BV-138 seaplane appeared. Its nose was tilted slightly downward, as if the scout was diligently sniffing for something. That was indeed the case. The plane circled beyond the reach of our guns, lurking in the fog, then reappearing. We knew that it was transmitting to the base in Norway the course, speed, composition and order of the convoy. Then another submarine appeared. The deafening explosions of depth bombs dropped by the escort ships rumbled. The sirens of the ships which thus communicated their position rang out because the fog grew thicker. Suddenly the bells rang on the Lord Austin, which was still well to the right of the convoy. A ship of some sort had been sighted. Our 100 telemilitera gun immediately turned in that direction, the lock swallowing the shell and shell casing with a clang. But the fog suddenly cleared and several large ships appeared on the horizon. It seemed to us that the squadron included battleships, cruisers and destroyers. We encountered only warships. There were no transports. Momentarily, everyone thought, Maybe it's the Tyrapits and Hipper that came out of Norway. After the appearance of the Herring, there was no need to maintain radio silence. Our radio operator hastily transmitted a message to the escort commander about the unknown ships. In response came the order, find out and report. As a result, our brave trawler rushed forward. The signalman hurriedly tapped the searchlight curtains, calling the mysterious armadillos. A few languid moments passed, and a searchlight flashed on the horizon. A moment later, the signalman shouted joyfully, Our own! 
one of our sailors ironically remarked, Lucky we didn't open fire first, we might have sunk one of our own battleships. As the big ships departed, unaware of the commotion they had caused, one of them relayed, Sorry I can't accompany you, good luck. It was a nice gesture, but we never saw our heavy ships again. In the afternoon the fog cleared and the whole convoy was now clearly visible. Just as clearly visible was the herring dangling on the horizon. It was said that if necessary these planes could stay in the air for up to 24 hours, then they were replaced by another scout. The German surveillance system worked with clockwork precision. In haste, someone fired a few shots at the German plane, but the shells, of course, flew too far from the target. Shortly thereafter, the scout was joined by other planes, this time seaplanes torpedo carrier Heinkel. Now, over the convoy circled already nine enemy planes. One link dropped, heading for the trailing ships, and somewhere behind immediately crackled anti-aircraft guns. Heinkel's dropped a torpedoes, but did not achieve a hits. Then followed a respite, and on the horizon again visibly only a scout. On the escort ships, for the last 24 hours, crews spent at battle stations 18 hours. During this time, the escort ships refuelled from the squadron tanker Aldersdale. The tanker Grey Ranger was still taking fuel, as it had to refuel our ships in Arkhangelsk. Aldersdale closed the central column of the convoy. It was not a very good position, because during refuelling ships had to reduce speed, and when the procedure is completed, they were far behind the convoy, which made the tanker very vulnerable. Captain Archibald Hobson decided to change the procedure. At the beginning of each refuelling, he would raise the ignore my manoeuvres signal and increase his speed, going out of formation. The tanker would pass between the columns, and when it was in line with the lead ships, would begin refuelling. In this case, the whole procedure took place inside the guard ring. None of the ships were separated from the convoy. At about 21 dot we got into a new fog, and again the bells of the loud battle rang out. To the convoy approached three torpedo carriers, and our gunners managed to make a few shots at them. The airplanes disappeared. Later, our commander, Lit Leslie Wathen, saw a submarine far ahead with binoculars. One of the planes landed on the water near it, but immediately took off in a hurry as a destroyer rushed there. It dropped a series of depth bombs at the spot where the boat had submerged. Later we passed a large oil slick in which the wreckage was floating, and so we thought the attack had been successful. German boats, however, were cunning game, very often throwing a little oil overboard to deceive pursuers. Toward midnight a terrible blow shook the whole ship like a small splinter. The men in the brig flew out of their bunks. We heard some kind of metallic scraping under the bottom. Apparently we had struck a submarine that was holding in shallow water, but we couldn't afford to stop and check what had happened. Still, we were satisfied. Judging by the force of the impact, we had severely mangled the boat's periscopes or even the deckhouse. At midnight, things calmed down again. We got into the polar day zone and the sun, instead of rising above the horizon and hiding behind it, was making some strange zigzags in the sky, just like German spy planes. We sent a radiogram to the Admiralty, detected by an airplane. Soon confirmation was received. Many of us mentally pictured the operations room in London, where the map showed the progress of the PQ-17. The day of July 2nd began pleasantly. The sea was calm and the sun shone brightly through a light haze. But it was a deceptive calm. The submarines had been cruising alongside for 24 hours, and there was often the thud of depth bombs dropped by the escort ships to drive the enemy away. The destroyer offer feared from Extremirangia to submarine that appeared on the surface. It missed, and the boat hastily submerged. Herring watched all this closely, lazily hanging back and forth over the very horizon. Toward noon, the scout was joined by five more of the same airplanes. They circled around the convoy like giant dragonflies. We were well aware that they were reporting our every move, but there was nothing we could do. At least one aircraft carrier, even the smallest one. In the afternoon, the six BV-138 scouts were joined by ten Ni-115 seaplanes, 
each carrying two torpedoes. They were not going to stall for too long, and at 16.30 the attack began. Heinkels were met by a barrage of fire from all ships that could see them. The German pilots showed little resolve and quickly raced back, most of them never dropping torpedoes. A small group of planes did try to harpoon the Pozariku, which was holding on the left shell of the convoy, but the pilots immediately abandoned their scheme as soon as the air defence ship opened fire. However, it was the USS Fury that drew first blood. The Heinkel shot down by it slammed into the water to the left ahead of the convoy. The entire German crew moved into a rubber dinghy, another Heinkel flew up and landed in cold blood on the water beside them, picking up their comrades. One of our ships chassied the seaplane, but it still managed to take off and get away. Yes, the German pilot showed remarkable courage. In the afternoon we enjoyed an unprecedented sight, over us flew his plane. It was a Val Ross from the cruiser London. He rushed to send a searchlight Keppel order to turn north and thereby increase the distance between the convoy and the enemy airfields. The sailors waved hello to the Val Rose. While he was still with us, three enemy planes arrived. They circled for a while near us and then quite unexpectedly rushed to the transports. They were driven back by a dense barrage and Val Ross found itself dangerously close to our own bursts. A circular signal was received from the Keppel, addressed to all the escort ships, thanking them for their determined and skilful action. Keep up the good work, boys. At this time the cruising party was twenty miles away, still waiting for German ships to appear. In the evening the constant worrying began as the herrings circled in the gaily bright skies. It was a soul-wrenching and far from pleasant sight. Even if one closed one's eyes to take a nap, the German planes still appeared before one's mind's eye. One of the destroyers summoned an airplane flaring off a searchlight with a message in German. Could you spin in the other direction? We're getting dizzy. To this the German pilot replied, anything for the British, and began spinning in the opposite direction. After that an idle chatter began between the escort ships and the plane, during which the Germans colourfully described the sad fate that awaited our convoy. At midnight we began to pass by the gigantic icebergs. Huge ice mountains frequent the area in summer. Glittering in the sunlight they seemed like enchanted castles, but for all their beauty they remained deadly dangerous. At about 3pm the Grey Ranga collided with a small iceberg and suffered a hole in its bow. The tanker reduced speed and Senor Mechanic David Hood, along with Captain Gosten, went to the Fora Peak to inspect the damage. The position appeared to be bayed. The breach was too large, and it was not possible to put a temporary patch over it. There was a danger that the forward tank Bulkeard would not hold. But even in this position, the captain did not dare to remain alone behind the convoy. Despite the risk, the tanker increased speed to join the convoy, but a radiogram was sent to the escort commander. In response, an order was received to turn back. At 1800 hours, the Grey Ranger came alongside the tanker Aldersdale, after which it turned back to North Shields for repairs. The enemy did not touch it. Aldersdale, which had to part with the convoy at the meridian of Cape Nordcap, was now forced to proceed to Arkhangelsk. The convoy had already lost three ships, none of which had been damaged by enemy action. And what will happen when the Germans do strike? The sailors were getting more and more nervous. The weather in the area of floating icebergs became much colder. We took one of the small icebergs from afar for an icy airplane. The Pozarica passed close to the ice flow, looking like a half-sunken ship. Suddenly, a curious walrus, a real walrus, not a submarine at all, surfaced near the Lord Austin. A large black head with two long tusks suddenly emerged from the wave looked intently at the passing ship and then just as suddenly disappeared. In the afternoon escort ships again had to chase the submarines, then appeared five Heinkel and dropped torpedoes from a great distance but did not hit. The destroyer Offer drove back another plane that tried to go on the attack. These sporadic raids were very unnerving. When on the horizon flashed the masts of cruisers' cover, their appearance cheered people a little. 
Everyone was sure that the cruisers, as well as being hundreds of miles behind the line fleet, waiting for the appearance of the Tirpitz, for which we were the bait. None of us had any idea that a radiogram had arrived from the Admiralty, announcing that the Tirpitz and Hipper had left their usual anchorage at Trondheim. Where they had gone was not known, as bad weather had hampered our scout planes. We continued to move forward. Time was now marked only by the clock, and the sun shone continuously. Each of us needed only one thing, a sound, long, uninterrupted sleep. The Aldersdale was kept busy refueling the escort ships. Now the Rowan, one of the two American destroyers included in the cruising squadron, approached. As the destroyer approached, several more torpedoes were seen. Their tracks were clearly visible in the clear Arctic water, so it was not difficult to evade them. Rowan was close to us when a group of three or four planes on the left bow of the convoy began manoeuvring to come out to attack. The appearance of the destroyer right in their path thwarted the Germans' intentions. They were clearly confused, not knowing whether to attack the destroyer or the transports. But Rowan did not give them time to remember and immediately opened fire. One plane immediately crashed into the water, then another. The third crossed the course of the destroyer, which fired on it from all guns. The plane didn't turn for about twenty seconds, and the Rowan passed right under it. The airplane burst into flames, the smoking airplane flew far ahead, followed by another, and both landed on the water. The damaged plane sank, and its pilots flew away in another machine before ships could arrive at the landing site. Another daring rescue operation, and luck smiled once again on the Germans. All is well, except that these pilots will soon return to strike us again. After the Rowan returned to the Wichita cruisers, the Wichita relayed to him, Welcome, how's the war going over there? The destroyer replied, Pretty darn good, we shot down one German airplane. When a convoy is this large, some skirmishes with enemy planes go unnoticed by many ships. Half the ships don't even realise how many torpedoes have been dropped. But those who find themselves in the path of those torpedoes will never forget those moments. Even the quickest glance at a torpedo that is coming straight at your ship makes you numb. You get the impression of unreality of what is happening, but at the same time you want to run away from here as fast as possible. Fast, manoeuvrable destroyers had every chance to dodge the torpedo, but clumsy transports and slow-moving escort ships like trawlers had a much harder time. The hair literally stood on end. Here is an example of such experiences of the crew of the Nofern Geme, after several planes dropped their torpedoes out of range of the guns. Helmsman Sid Kerslake was on his way to the wheelhouse when someone yelled from above, Torpedo on the starboard shell! As he followed the torpedo, Kerslake realised it was coming at a 15 degree angle, heading straight for the engine room. And he was standing directly above that compartment, his heart pounding like a sledgehammer. He heard the captain's voice breaking, Hard to port! and was relieved to see that the torpedo was now on a parallel course, rapidly overtaking the trawler. New shouts. Passing! Kerslake saw a chain of bubbles cut by the hem's bowstring. The trawler was making ten knots, developing maximum speed to catch up with the convoy. A strong wind carried the smoky to the starboard shell, at a fifteen-degree angle so one of the planes was able to take advantage of the unexpected cover and crept up stealthily, dropping a torpedo. The Germans were masters of using tricks like this. Lord Howe Howe was making another broadcast. On the ships of the PQ-17 convoy they could hear him describing the sad fate that awaited the convoy. Howe Howe called the ships by name, but especially often he sent threats to the salvage ships Zafaran and Zamalek, which had been taken from Germany as reparations after World War I. They were now owned by the Egyptian government. They were now owned by the Egyptian company Egyptian Mail Line and bore exotic names. They looked rather ugly, but they could be easily distinguished by the numerous life rafts on the decks, as well as a large black spot in the middle part of the hull. The fact is that the dinghy deck cargo was regularly and liberally oiled, so that there would be no problems when launching. On this voyage, an official admiralty observer of the rank of Captain Second Rank 
was on board the Zamalek to find out why so many warships were being lost on Russian routes. He was immediately under fire because during one of the first raids, the Zamalek was the first ship to be machine gunned. One of the herrings that were following the convoy suddenly pounced on him. The airplane passed over the rescue ship, pouring it from onboard machine guns. One bullet pierced the floor of the captain's overcoat and would surely have hit him in the leg if he had not bent his knee at that moment. The captain was lucky, but one of the Zamalek gunners was badly wounded when a fragment of an exploding shell hit him in the eye. Midnight passed and the day of the 4th of July came. There was a temporary lull as we passed north of Bear Island. On board the Palomares, signalman Baron Taylor had just come on watch. The view from the bridge was somewhat unusual. At sea, visibility was good in all directions, but the sky was obscured by a fog that travelled a little above the masts. Everyone assumed it was providing good cover for the convoy from enemy aircraft. While Taylor was looking at the ships walking calmly on the quiet sea, he heard a strange sound like the noise of airplane engines. He reported it to the officer of the watch. He called for the captain, and until the captain arrived on the bridge, everyone began to listen. Taylor thought he heard the sound again, and quite distinctly, but no one else heard anything. Then the signalman began to imagine what the captain would say when he found out that the alarm was a false alarm. But, to Taylor's relief, when the captain went up to the bridge, the roar of the aircraft engines was clearly heard by everyone assembled there. The sailors strained to determine from which direction it was coming and hoped that the airplane had failed because of the fog to detect the convoy, although it was circling quite close somewhere to starboard. Suddenly the plane spiked through the fog on the flank of the convoy and dropped a torpedo before the anti-aircraft guns could fire on it. Then it swiftly dived back into the fog and disappeared. Taylor rushed to the ship's siren and gave six short honks to warn merchant ships. The Palomares turned abruptly to dodge the torpedo. It passed a few yards in front of the air defence ship's bow, but went straight at the merchant ship on the left side of the ship's port side. The time was 14.30 hours. That merchant vessel was the ill-fated Christopher Newport. The sailors at the guns on the feed panicked and, shrieking with terror, rushed down the gangway from the running bridge to the portside lifeboats. Only gunner Hugh Wright remained at his post. He fired into the water just ahead of the torpedo, hoping to blow it up. Wright changed the magazines of his 7.62-minute machine gun until he had fired all of them. He shot accurately and coolly, but he cursed his worthless weak machine gun. The torpedo disappeared from sight under the starboard davits which were piled overboard and then Wright was thrown by the explosion from the bridge to the David deck two levels below. In the fall, he broke his ankle and lost consciousness. The torpedo hit Wright in the centre of the Christopher Newport's hull, where the stokers and mechanics were keeping watch. After the explosion, a column of black smoke rose above the ship. The machinery steeled and the vessel rolled sideways, cutting through the formation. The Empire Tide was forced to turn away abruptly to avoid a collision. It was extremely sad to see the huge ship quickly falling behind the convoy, crippled and helpless. Everything happened very quickly and completely unexpectedly. Soon the Zamalek appeared to remove the crew. The Zafaran also took part in the rescue of the sailors. But to the observers of the Peter Kerr, the ship appeared to be a smoking ruin, on which not a single man remained. Every boat on the side facing the Peter Kerr was dangling vertically on a single halyard. The captain of the Christopher Newport came aboard the Zamalek without leaving his revolver behind. He claimed that he could not do without it with such a rabble as his crew, but the captain of the salvage vessel quietly disarmed the warrior. The damaged Newport could fall into enemy hands, so it was torpedoed by one of the subwarines. The torpedo exploded with a terrible rumbly, but even then it took a full 20 minutes before the ship went down with her precious cargo. The rest of the morning passed relatively quietly. The four airplanes hovered over the horizon and seemed to the sailors to be perfectly still. Soon, however, they became accustomed to them, and the sight no longer aroused any interest. 
We passed far north of Medveji Island, a dreary rock that was only rarely visited by occasional fishermen. Many at this point were recalling their incredible stories. This island, hard to spot at a great distance, was on the most dangerous section of the Arctic route. From here was the closest to the German airfields in Norway. We waited tensely for further developments. In the battle area, all people's thoughts were centred on personal safety, which largely depended on what a man was wearing. Would he continue to bundle up in thick, warm clothing, or would he strip down, risking turning into ice? Heavy clothing would instantly drag a man to the bottom, but a long watch in light clothing on an open gun platform would kill just as surely. So many compromised by taking off the shoe covers and putting on thick stockings and shoes. If the ship sank or a man was thrown into the water by an explosion, he had a good chance of getting rid of his wool overcoat, scarves and raincoat and everything else. After that, he could try to get to the rescue net, but it is impossible to drop the shoe covers. They drag a man down into the icy abyss like a cannonball strapped to his feet. And at such a tense moment, the sailors of the British ships were greatly surprised to see the American ships suddenly abruptly lower their stars and stripes from the gaffs. Were they out of their minds? The answer came just a couple minutes later, when the flags were again flying up the masts. They were the new stars and stripes, ten times the size of the old ones, tattered and salted by the Atlantic winds. Of course they were. After all, today is the 4th of July Independence Day, a fine, defiant gesture in the face of the enemy. Loud music came from the American ships and sailors began to dance on the decks, and this was no attempt to keep warm. In the cruiser squadron, the same thing was happening. The Tuscaloosa and Wichita also lowered their regular marching flags and raised huge ceremonial flags. An exchange of signals followed. Admiral Hamilton relayed to the American cruisers and destroyers in his formation, On the day of your great holiday it would be inhumane to keep you at battle stations, but even freedom of navigation can be interpreted in two ways. We are honoured to have you by our side, and I wish you all good hunting. The Wichita cruiser responded, We are honoured to be with you as you stand up for the ideals that the 4th of July symbolises for us. We are especially blessed to be part of your squadron. The celebration of this anniversary is always accompanied by great fireworks. I trust that you will not disappoint us. The British cruiser Norfolk joined in the congratulations, relaying to the Wichita, We wish you all the best. The United States is the only country with a known birthday. To this, Wichita replied, Thank you. We think you should be celebrating Mother's Day. And soon the celebrations began or at least the fireworks. The morning of that wonderful day, the 4th of July, was cold but clear. The sun shone in a clear blue sky, and the bright blue sea was as calm as a mill dam. The cruiser formation had moved closer and was now visible a few miles ahead, on the right, of course. Four cruisers, three destroyers, and a Valros seaplane circling lazily overhead. Our little trawler was closest to the cruisers, they were located to the right of the convoy, that is, to the south, from where we should expect the appearance of enemy aircraft. All the sailors of the compound were carefully watching the sky. On the mirror-like surface of the sea were reflected going in perfect order convoy ships. The transports followed nine columns of four or five ships each. Air defence ships were positioned between the columns and other guard ships lined up around them. Two tiny specks, submarines, could be seen behind the stern of the transports, but a couple of herrings stubbornly dangled on the horizon, and now Jew 88 bombers began to join them. They came one by one or in pairs, and circled like vultures, waiting for the right moment. But so far they were not approaching the convoy. Valros hastily landed and was hoisted aboard the cruiser. Two adjusters from the American cruisers who were conducting anti-submarine patrols also returned after a brief skirmish with the German scouts. They were not at all suited for combat with the much more powerful German planes, and in the afternoon the Ju-88s began sporadic attacks. They continuously dropped bombs, and although they did not achieve a single hit, 
still kept the anti-aircraft gunners in constant tension. The muffled boom of multi-barreled pom-poms was interspersed with the sharp crackle of Ehrlichons and Beauforts as the attacked transports fired everything they could fire. The fog had descended a little, and airplanes were often heard but not seen. More German planes soon arrived, several Heinkels and a couple of Fokkerwolfs, but as yet the enemy had not attempted a massive attack. Toward nightfall, things seemed to calm down. The American destroyer Wainwright separated from the cruiser squadron to refuel from the Aldersdale. At about 17 hour, as it cut through the convoy formation heading for the tanker, six Heinkels appeared on the left. Don Moon, commander of the Wainwright, headed toward the planes to fire on them. The destroyer's guns could fire at 12,000 yards, but when fire was opened, the shells lay undershot at about 500 yards. The moon came even closer and fired several shots, but even now could not reach the planes. The German pilots appeared to be well aware of the range of the American guns, but Moon made it clear to them that he was on standby. All the while, the merchant ships and escort ships fired all their guns. They were joined by the London, which opened fire with her main calibre from extreme range. This raid involved 12 Heinkel. They described the circle and dropped torpedoes, but no success. Some time aircraft circled around the convoy and then tried to attack the ship's escort, but retreated, met with heavy fire. By the end of the day, the convoy repulsed several attacks by German aircraft, with some of the ships received minor damage, mostly from the actions of overexcited anti-aircraft gunners. A new respite followed. By 18 Earl's hours, Wainwright still managed to reach Aldersdale and begin refuelling. At this time, the haze on the starboard side of the convoy descended even lower, so the ships that went in the left columns could see the bright sun and blue sky in the north, and the ships of the right columns only a cloudy grey shroud in the south. But over the water itself, below the shroud of fog, visibility was excellent and the sea was as smooth as glass. Soon, an admiralty radiogram was received, which warned that an unknown number of planes had left the Norwegian airfields and would be over the convoy in an hour. We all knew perfectly well that this heralded a powerful attack. The Germans appeared almost exactly on schedule. The radar of the air defence ships detected the approaching planes and they alerted the convoy. The Lord Austin received a radiogram stating that 25 German planes had been spotted at a distance of 30 miles. Besides them, several other planes were circling overhead and were clearly about to take part in a massive attack as well. Reaver Afton raised the JG signal, which meant, attend to guns, prepare to engage. Those escort ships that had more powerful anti-aircraft weapons closed formation to put up a tighter fire screen. Every gun was brought to full readiness and the Germans could be met with a serious repulse. The main role in the coming spectacle was to be played by two air defence ships. It happened at 6.22pm. Wainwright was continuing to refuel from a tanker when a report was received that 19 low-flying aircraft were heading toward the convoy. Captain First Rank Moon immediately ordered the refuelling hoses to be given up and full throttle to get into position in the path of the approaching planes. At this time, the planes circling overhead attempted to divert the destroyer toward them. The sailors heard the noise of engines on the starboard shell somewhere above the fog layer. Moon rushed to the starboard wing of the bridge, listened for a few seconds, then ordered the helmsman to put the rudder starboard. A few seconds later, three explosions rumbled, and columns of water soared 100 yards from the destroyer right on the line of its former course. The unseen bomber put his testicles very accurately. Only a timely manoeuvre by Moon saved the ship. Another plane tried to similarly catch Keppel, but the British destroyer also dodged. The bombs exploded less than 100 yards astern of him. Aboard the Pozariki, sailor William Maine, from his battle station on the Utes, noticed a large number of seaplanes that he thought intended to land on the water astern of the convoy. Perhaps they were jokes of polar mirages, but it seemed to Maine that the planes were standing still and holding a council. Then one plane took off, followed by the others. From the bridge of the destroyer, 
Offer, it seemed as if the plains had suddenly sprung up all over the southern horizon like a cloud of mosquitoes. Tension was building aboard the Pozariki as her radar picked up more planes and they were getting closer. Ten enemy planes approaching, the senior gunner reported, but almost immediately corrected himself. Twenty planes. Thirty. On the bridge, Sub-Lieutenant Leslie Clemente, chief of the radar station, counted 42 planes approaching the convoy from the right side. The lead plane kept ahead on course. There may have been more planes, but at that moment the Germans began their attack, and Clemence stopped counting. He rushed down to be at the artillery radar screen. The markings mottled on the radar screen, and Clemence tried to brace his knees against the transmitter housing to keep his legs from shaking. He expected the ship to get a torpedo in the next second. Clemens was utterly convinced that at least one of those planes would hit the Poza Rica. On the USS Lemington, sailor Oswald Tranter, on duty at the radar screen, had no time to report. Twelve planes approaching, bearing. Twenty planes approaching, bearing. Approaching thirty-five planes, bearing. On the screen, the individual marks merged into one big blur and Tranter could no longer hear his own reports to the bridge as a real shambles began aboard the destroyer. Lord Austin was on the right edge of the convoy and we, looking back, saw the whole course of the battle. A swarm of Ni-111s and Ju-88s armed with torpedoes began the attack. Then one of the observers suddenly shrieked, Look, one of those bastards! A small black dot was racing toward the convoy, gliding close to the mirror surface like a water viper. Everything was quiet for a moment, and then a barrage of fire rained down on the lead plane. The plane flew straight ahead, not even trying to manoeuvre catching up with the convoy from behind. Here next to the submarines trailing the formation, two bursts went up, and then all attention turned to the transports behind the line of warships. As the airplane sped under the nose of the Pozariki, the sailors saw the pilot make a hand gesture that meant now you're all going up in the air. The firing was hot but completely indiscriminate. Pom-pom shells, Pozariki, hit not only in the brave seaplane but also in the sides of the transports. When Heinkel already began to leave, a line from the right pom-pom air defence ship hit it, and in the tail part of the fuselage appeared small flames. Aldersdale senior mechanic William Brown pointed his binoculars at the plane as it flew close to the tanker. I could see everything through the plexiglass of the cockpit. Tracer bullets were piercing the plane from all sides, and the cabin was a solid mass of fire. Inside it were five men, four of them lying dead or dying. The pilot was swaying from side to side, but still holding on. I saw him reach out his hand and touch something, and a moment later the torpedo slammed into the water and the pilot collapsed. Fire quickly encompassed the plane as it passed in front of the Pozariki's nose. Then it touched the water, jumped up, dropped again, and buried its nose in the water. There was a splash, followed by a blinding flash, and a column of flame rose into the air, surrounded by puffs of smoke. And then the cockpit of the airplane, continuing to blaze hotly, slowly disappeared under the water. When the Pozarica passed by, there remained only an oil slick, in the centre of which flickered tongues of fire. It was a terrific example of suicidal bravery and skill. The attack was successful. The dropped torpedoes smashed into the water with a splash and raced toward the merchant ships. One of them hit the British transport Navarino. There was a terrible explosion. The ship literally jumped and shrouded in smoke. Almost immediately the convoy was attacked by several more planes. Like their commander, they flew so low that they seemed to touch the water. The little poisonous insects were getting bigger and bigger, but then suddenly they were hidden by a black wall of explosions. At that moment, the deafening rumble of gunfire was cut off by a monstrous explosion. To the sailors on the transports, it seemed that the Wainwright exploded. In reality, it was the destroyer opened fire from all 127 military guns. Next began firing anti-aircraft guns, and the destroyer turned into an active volcano. Already with the first salvos, two airplanes were shot down. Everyone saw how they quickly sank, 
back in the air tails with large black swastikas. Bright yellow life rafts appeared next to the downed planes, each with at least one person on it. The acrid smoke of burned gunpowder enveloped the Wainwright, shell casings raining down in hail as the destroyer opened fire with 20mm Ehrlichons. Its 127 mint guns didn't stop firing even when the planes were less than 100 yards away. At first, the shells burst a short distance from the torpedo carriers, and then one of them rumbled under the Heinkel's left wing, nearly flipping it over. By some miracle, the pilot managed to level the plane and dropped two small, thick torpedoes, which fell into the water, bounced twice, and then dived and rushed to the convoy. By this time, the Wainwright was directly in the path of the German planes, and they split up. Some tried to go around the destroyer from the bow, some from the stern. At least three more planes were shot down in a barrage of fire. Several more went up in smoke. One of the planes skidded just a few feet from the Wainwright's foretop. Everyone could see the pilot grinning as the 20 militant shells tore into the belly of the Heinkel. The German planes had to descend under low clouds to attack, which was a definite advantage for us. The enemy was foresaid to be exposed to dense anti-aircraft fire, including two perfectly armoured air defence ships. The rumble was indescribable. It seemed that nothing could survive in this flood of explosives that flew into the air, but the other planes continued on their way. They spun and twirled like a flock of black crows scared off by gunfire, but still some of them stubbornly headed toward the target. Some of the pilots hesitated. They turned in different directions, trying to avoid the firewall. The planes darted along the columns of transport so close that the sailors could see the pilots sitting in the cockpits. Sometimes the spectacle was fantastic. Sailors on the bridges had to bend down to see the planes flying over the water. They flew so close you could hit them with a slingshot. The seas were filled with torpedoes, their frothy trails streaming toward the merchant ships like snakes. The ether immediately came alive. My God, she's coming right at us. Bellingham, look out, two coming at you. Of course, some of the torpedoes hit the target. Three planes flew alongside the new Liberty-type transport William Hooper, which had settled deep into the water under a load of tanks and trucks lined up on deck. The transport fired several rounds from 120mm and 76mm guns, as well as those machine guns that could fire on the enemy. The left engine of one of the planes burst into flames. A direct hit from a 76mm shell tore off the right wing of another. However, a third plane cold-bloodedly came within 880 feet and dropped two torpedoes at point-blank range. William Hooper put left rudder and managed to dodge one of them, but the second hit the starboard side directly into the engine room. The explosion destroyed the machinery and disabled the steering gear. Three men in the engine room were killed, a fire broke out, and the transport began to sink. Three sailors and four men of the engine crew immediately jumped overboard, and the captain was forced to personally prevent the launching of life rafts until the ship finally stopped. The next torpedo passed less than 20 feet astern of the Aldersdale and hit the Russian tanker Azerbaijan. The hit hit the tank just forward of the engine room. The hole was very large. The tanker turned steeply to the right and only with great difficulty managed to avoid collision with the Empire Tide. The Azerbaijan passed close astern of the Empire Tide. A fountain of oil was spurting out of the hole and a huge tail of black smoke was trailing behind the tanker. Machine gunner on the bridge of the escort destroyer, Ledbury, had time to give only one short line on this torpedo carrier, but it hit the target. Blazing Azerbaijan quickly lagged behind the convoy, but the British were amazed to see how one of the women rushed to the machine gun at the stern and also opened fire on the torpedo carrier. The airplane soon plummeted into the water, when the tanker was hit from the bridge of the minesweeper Holcyon on the intercom shouted down, Guys, get out quickly upstairs. It's a sight to behold. The tanker is going to crash. At that moment, no one realised the utter cynicism of such an invitation. The radio operator, J.E. Hart, jumped up on deck to admire the scene. The sea was bright blue, but here and there floated wreckage, dinghies, people in life jackets. 
They were trying to get out of the sprawling oil slick. German torpedo carriers flew at such a low altitude that the transports in the convoy had to shoot very carefully, so as not to hit a neighbouring ship. However, in the ensuing turmoil, misses were inevitable. On one of the transports, a mast collapsed, blown down by a neighbour's shot. Silver Sword, closing the fourth column, received in the starboard 102 meter shell from another American transport. Fortunately, however, the shell did not explode and remained lying in the number one hold. The American transports coming from the left of the Empire Tide opened fire when the German planes were astern of the convoy. But the planes were closing in and the Americans kept firing, gradually lowering the barrels of their guns and machine guns until a barrage of bullets rained down on the British vessel. Its tackle was torn apart, its lifeboats riddled. Smoke bombs under the platform of the 12-pounder gun were showered with a jet of red-hot lead. Had the line travelled only two inches higher, it would have struck the legs of the gun crew. One of the gunners on the platform above the bridge started to descend, but barely had he put his foot on the gangway before he was shot in the shin. But even all this mess didn't stop the Empire Tide gunners from shooting down two torpedo carriers. One of them was destroyed by a direct hit from a 12-pounder shell in the cockpit, Machine gunner Jimmy Gordon, along with his beloved Colt twin, was stationed on the roof of the Ocean Freedom's wheelhouse, but as the attack began, he was bypassing the other guns to make sure all was well. When Skipper Walker saw that the ship is approaching the enemy torpedo bomber and no one at the machine gun, he himself rushed up and pointed the machine gun at the German plane. But then Gordon came running in and pushed the captain away from the machine gun. Walker swayed and, to steady himself, grabbed hold of the lineman's trigger and yanked it. There was a noxious hiss and the rocket flew, dragging the cable behind it. The captain shrieked. At that moment, the airplane flew exactly over the bridge and the missile hit it. The left wing of the Heinkel was cut off like a razor. The plane burst into flames and fell into the sea a few yards ahead of the transport. Through the crackle of gunfire, Gordon said to the captain, and today is my wedding anniversary. To this, Captain Walker replied, consider yourself lucky. The salute does not give off 21 guns, but many more. The sailors of the Dianella were grumbling all the way as all of the corvette's anti-aircraft guns jammed. The 120 millimeter gun was firing at minimum elevation angle at passing planes and the shockwave blew out the door of its own wheelhouse. New curses. The captain ordered a ceasefire, as they were hurting themselves more than the Germans. Meanwhile, one of the unnoticed dramas of war played out on the Zamalek. Just as the air raid began, Surgeon Lieutenant Norman McCallum began a complicated operation on a ship's gunner. He had received a shrapnel wound to the eye yesterday. The Zamalek, shuddering from the volleys of its own guns and close bursts, moved forward, and the surgeon worked methodically and calmly, as if he were in a hospital room on shore. Though the surgeon's hands shuddered as the ship jerked from the volley, McCallum had already begun stitching up the wound. But then he had to stop briefly because the Zamalek tilted sharply. The surgeon was forced to strap himself to the operating table in order not to fall. The delicate operation came to an end as the Zamalek turned around to begin picking up the crews of the damaged vessels. Climbing up, the medics saw fresh holes in the superstructures. The barrage balloon was missing somewhere, but otherwise the ship was intact. At the time of the battle, the cruisers were less than 10,000 yards from the convoy, but according to instructions did not intervene to avoid being hit by aircraft or submarines. They were waiting for the artillery battle that the Admiralty had long promised. The sailors of the cruisers clenched their fists with rage, as they could not help the transports. Above the convoy, the whole sky was covered with brown and black patches of bursts. London and Norfolk gave on the enemy planes several volleys from a great distance, but it was useless. German planes did not pay attention to the cruisers and stubbornly flew in the direction of the convoy. The fact that the London still managed to shoot down one plane was a poor consolation. The Americans felt even worse. 
There was nothing they could do to help, as their 127 millimeter shells had no remote fuses, only contact fuses, which required a direct hit on the plane. On the bridge of the Wichita, listened with admiration to the radio conversations between the transports and escort ships. An imperturbable voice from the speaker coldly described exploding ships, burning airplanes, spotted torpedoes. It was very hard to be completely safe when comrades nearby were risking their lives. The cold-blooded commentator continued to describe the convoy's actions, which the Americans found simply superb. When the sailors of the Wichita saw two enemy planes plummet downward and turn into fireballs as they hit the waiter, they shrieked with joy. On the bridge of the cruiser Signalman G, Edward Young saw through binoculars as the Blomenfoss crashed into the sea, but the pilot managed to level the plan and landed it on floats alongside the convoy. All the neighbouring ships opened fire on the plane, but strangely enough, they were not immediately able to destroy it. Even more surprising was that another seaplane landed nearby, picked up the crew and took off. Lord Austin also opened frantic fire, and we saw the other plane land on the water to pick up the pilot, who had jumped out with a parachute and was now dangling in a rubber dinghy. The destroyer rushed over there, but the planer flew away. The sub wherein rose to the surface, picked up the other pilot and immediately submerged, then the monstrous roar of dozens of guns went silent as suddenly as it had begun. There was a leaden silence, which was occasionally broken by occasional shots at rescue and reconnaissance planes. They circled lazily over the convoy after the torpedo carriers had departed. The convoy, strangely enough, kept the formation, although, as it seemed to us, the battle went on for several hours. In reality, everything took a few minutes. Behind remained grim evidence of the raging battle. Stains of burning gasoline, lifeboats and rubber boats, the wreckage of downed aircraft. Far astern, a group of German pilots were trying to row their dinghies. A red rocket, a distress signal, was slowly descending on a small parachute. Several pilots stood on the sinking planes waiting to be picked up by rescuers. The Lord Middleton's observer reported seeing an unknown object on the left side of the bow. The trawler went there, preparing his 100 TU Mietus gun. He was 1,500 yards away from the object when another German aircraft sat down to pick up the downed crew. Lord Middleton opened fire. The first shell lay quite close, but the first shot also proved to be the last. The trawler's old gun could not withstand, and the roller broke. After that, the British only had to watch the Germans save their comrades. This required strong nerves from the pilots. It took several hours before the crew of the trawler managed to repair their fossilised gun. British and American sailors also found themselves in the water. An enemy plane tried to bombard them, but was itself victimised by one of the corvettes. Other planes shelled our rescue ships. All three ships that were hit quickly fell behind the convoy. Corvettes and destroyers were now hustling around them. Navarino and William Hooper were lurching and smoking. The Rathlin moved cautiously among the floating wreckage. Its life nets and throwing ends were lowered overboard so that men trapped in the icy water could cling to them. Many sailors barely had the strength to climb to the deck of the rescue vessel. In all, the Rathlin rescued more than 60 men from the William Hooper. Some of the crew of the Navarino were taken in by the Zafaran. Among those rescued was a dazed Filipino who was sitting on the hatch cover when the ship was hit by a torpedo. All he could squeeze out was, I flew up and then down, and as I flew down I saw an airplane underneath me. At first it seemed to us that the Azerbaijan had disappeared forever in its funeral pyre, but then a cry came from the bridge of the escort destroyer Ledbury, Jesus Christ, the broads have put out the fire. The female crew had indeed shown great ingenuity, although some of the male sailors were not so steadfast. The four sailors, along with the commissar, hurriedly left the tanker in a lifeboat and were picked up by the Zamalek. The Aldersdale's observers saw several others die as the hastily lowered lifeboats fell into the sea. One dinghy, the Azerbaijan, capsized itself and the sailors spilled into the sea. Zafaran picked up several Russians who had probably been thrown overboard by the explosion. One of them was severely wounded in the leg. 
The surrounding sea was covered with a layer of linseed oil, so the Russians could not climb aboard as their hands slipped from the ropes. A few sailors of the Azerbaijan climbed into a dinghy and began to row away from the ship, when suddenly a machine gun burst through the water near them. It was fired by a woman. Another woman shouted something into a megaphone and waved her hand, ordering them to return. The rowers stopped, but a new machine gun burst hurried them on. They returned to the tanker and climbed aboard to help the women put out the fire. The bulk of the Azerbaijan's cargo was non-flammable linseed oil, not oil at all. It was oil that was now beating a fountain into the sky. So with the help of volunteers, the captain of the tanker managed to save his ship. Sometime later, the trailing ships of the convoy saw with great amazement that the Azerbaijan had broken away from the high column of smoke and was moving again. Its full speed was 15 knots, so the tanker caught up with us quite easily. The captain won, but at a high cost. One of the dead was the ship's radio operator, his wife. The women on board the second Russian tanker Donbass were happily waving to the escort ships. Young and not so young, they were all dressed in long black dresses, over which they wore cloaks up to their heels and zudvestki. These unusual figures remained long in our memory. Ledbury and Offer turned aside to ward off a supposedly spotted submarine. Offer claimed the destruction of one torpedo carrier. It was on this ship that ex-gun commander Chief Sailor Tommy Furness had his crew marching around the rig with mops on their shoulder as the first attack was expected. The sounds of a brisk march poured out of the speakers. What a picture! Twelve German planes were destroyed for sure. We saw them sink. Several more planes were probably destroyed. Many were so badly damaged that they hardly made it to their airfields in Norway. But in any case, our claims were more than moderate. Wainwright was credited with only one airplane so far, which sank in full view of everyone. The destruction of three more planes had to be confirmed by the captain. The destroyer left us to return to the cruisers. It was seen off by cheers from all the nearby transports and congratulations on the excellent firing from the Pozariki. To this, the Wainwright replied, Thank you. It's been a fun holiday. Later, the destroyer transmitted to the Wichita. We had the fireworks display that was talked about so much. It was simply amazing that the enemy, having used so many torpedoes, did not achieve more hits. Fortune was on our side, but in doing so, the skippers of the transports showed remarkable skill, as did the escort ships. Many ships came within a hair's breadth of destruction. Offer, skillfully dodged three torpedoes. The crew of the Palomaresa, which was right in the path of the attackers on the right flank of the convoy, did not even count the torpedoes that passed close to the side of the ship. On board the Pozariki, after the battle, it was impossible to walk on the upper deck littered with fired shell casings. One curious evidence of the hard work of the gunners can be cited. When the battle began, the 102 millimeter gun loader Charles Gooch rushed to the gun from the bridge, where he was on watch as an observer. Gooch was wrapped up to his eyebrows, a thick sweater, jacket, wool overcoat, booties, and a long scarf wrapped several times around his neck. When the battle was over, he was stripped to the waist. Losses on the escort ships were caused by careless firing by neighbouring ships. For example, on the corvette Poppy, the gunner of the 102 mm gun was shot in the butt by the destroyer USS Lemington, which was sailing on the Port Traverse. However, the gunner did not discover the wound until after the battle. Poppy had to dodge torpedoes several times. At one tense moment, Sub-Lieutenant Dennis Brooke, who was aft of the pom-pom, saw a torpedo leap out from under the corvette's keel and go straight for the transport. Usually, torpedoes were set at a greater depth of travel for heavily laden transports, so they skipped under small ships without harming them. Keppel narrowly escaped death when the lead plane crashed into the water near the destroyer's stern. The sailors were still looking at the spot where the Heinkel had dived when suddenly they saw a chain of bubbles coming straight at the ship, moreover, straight at the artillery cellar over which they were standing. Confused, they just stood there, unable to move. 
Sailor Harold William recalled that at that moment he was wondering just how many pieces he was going to be torn into. But before panic set in, the ship's stern veered sharply to the right and the danger disappeared. It didn't take a line in the Keppel's logbook. Torpedo passed astern. As the Lord Austin fired the last shell, our captain came down from the bridge. His blue eyes were burning with excitement, and his short beard was tousled. Breaking into a shout, he said, That was a good fight, wasn't it? Yes, it was indeed a good fight. It was the first time many of you had been in a real fight, and then came the delayed reaction. As the flame-covered airplanes fell into the sea, we jumped and shouted for joy. But now we thought of the people trapped inside those balls of fire. Enemies, evil fascists who wanted to kill us. But still they were people, and we must admit, brave people. The convoy moved on in perfect order, leaving behind the William Hooper and the Navarino. The escort ships had to scuttle the damaged transports. We lost three ships, but we repulsed the first major air attack by the Germans. Will there be another attack? And what about the submarines? Were the destroyers able to drive them off or not? We had another four or five days of travel ahead of us, and we did not yet know what our chances were. The main problem was ammunition. We had already used up quite a lot of it. If more heavy raids followed, would we run out of shells too quickly? Keppel cut through the formation of the convoy, and Captain Two Rank Broom noted with satisfaction that all the ships are in good order and look even more proud than before. I thought that everyone clearly felt the enemy realised that he could not cope with PQ-17, and that was gratifying. In his diary, Broom wrote that he thought the convoy could keep moving forward until the ships ran out of ammunition. Commodore Dowding thought the same, and both commanders were confident of success as we entered the Barents Sea. The Keppel signalled the Empire Tide. Would you mind shaking off the pursuer? Apparently the AMU ship did not receive this message, as the hurricane did not take off. But in any case, the evening sky had cleared completely, save for a few clouds. The German scouts seemed to be gone. But while the observers surveyed the calm cold sea, the radio room began to bustle. It was clear to the radio operators of the escort ships that something unusual was in the air, because the Admiralty radiogram was marked OU, extra urgent. Such a thing was used only in extreme cases. The first radiogram, addressed to Hamilton, sounded an ominous bell. Special urgency. Cruisers to withdraw to the west at full speed. Admiral Hamilton's cruisers were, in any case, due to turn back as previously planned in the very near future. The command was not going to introduce them into the submarine-infested Barents Sea. But the Admiralty ordered them to withdraw at full speed. This could only mean one thing. Missing German ships were detected by Allied intelligence and cruisers were in imminent danger. A little earlier, Admiral Hamilton had received orders to remain with the convoy until special orders. Now an urgent radiogram confirmed the worst fears. Twelve minutes later, a second radiogram arrived. It was addressed to Captain Second Rank Broom. Urgent. In view of the threat of surface ships, convoy to disperse and follow to Russian ports. The officers had no time to recover from the shock as the third radiogram was received, sent 13 minutes after the first. Especially urgent, convoy to disperse. Captain Second Rank Broom recalled, It was a fateful order. The form seemed to explode in my hand. If anyone still had doubts, the last radiogram completely dispelled them. Not only the cruisers were in danger, but the convoy itself. The tear pits. Probably the battleship had gone to sea. Only he could have thrown the Admiralty into such a terrible panic. For merchant ships, even to disperse was more bad, but to disperse. When dispersed, the transports left the formation, and each at its maximum speed proceeded to its port of destination. Since all our ships were headed for Arkhangelsk, the assumption of calling at Murmansk was rejected. All the same, the ships remained together and received a weak but still hope for salvation. But having received the order to disperse, 
they had to disperse on all 32 rumbas, from north to south. Each ship was left to its own devices. The situation was dire. Admiral Hamilton and Captain Broom were forced to carry out an order that they both did not like at all. However, they believed that the Admiralty had some special information not known to commanders at sea. It was this information that forced commanders to issue orders over the Admiral's head on the scene. The officers and sailors of the escort ships did not understand anything at all. They saw no reason for such a decision. And what was it like for the sailors of merchant ships who saw the warships abandoning them? And what about the duty of escort ships to protect their transports at all costs? After all, this tradition of the British Navy has never been broken before. The ships of the immediate escort immediately began to inquire by flag signals and Aldi's lamps from the commander what was going on. We were lost in speculation. At 2032, Keppel transmitted. All convoy ships to disperse and follow to Russian ports. Guard ships, except for destroyers, independently follow to Arkhangelsk. The destroyers to join the Keppel. This order gave Commodore Dowding a real shock. Unable to believe it, he twice asked to repeat it. Finally, a double flag signal number eight crept up the mast of the reefer Afton, which meant disperse and proceed at full speed. Dowding's surprise and disappointment were nothing compared to the feelings of the skippers of merchant ships who simply could not believe their own eyes. If the big shots in London and Washington had heard what was now being said about them on the convoy ships, they would have burned with shame. At that moment, the sailors on the transports felt like sacrificial sheep. It seemed incredible that they should be abandoned to their fate. When the radio operator on the old transport Washington, built during the First World War, came to the bridge to report about the intercepted orders to the escort ships and the covering squadron, immediately a rumour was born as if the tear pits, together with destroyers, had already gone out to intercept the convoy. Skipper Julius Richter refused to believe it. I decided that these radiograms were either erroneous or false. The Germans were capable of any ruse to get the escort away from the convoy. But what at first appeared to be a rumour turned into a sad reality when the appropriate order was raised on the River Afton. I called the gunnery commander and the officers of the ship to the bridge to inform them of the fateful order and to discuss what would happen next. While we reasoned over our hopeless situation, one of the greatest naval tragedies of this war played out before our eyes as our escort ships one by one abandoned the convoy. The Lord Austin was still holding on the right flank of the convoy when the signalman reported seeing a flag signal ordering the convoy to disperse. Our captain refused to believe it. Don't be an idiot. Request a proper signal by searchlight, he ordered. The signalman obeyed but received only a confirmation of the order. Convoy PQ-17 had ceased to exist. Although no one believed in the reality of what was happening, the skippers of merchant ships obediently carried out the order. One by one the transports left the formation and went in different directions. From our position we could see perfectly well how it all happened. The Keppel's last signal to the Commodore read, I'm sorry to have to leave you behind. Looks like a bloody business ahead. Goodbye and good luck. He signalled the other five destroyers to follow him and led them towards the enemy. Captain Second Rank Broom believed the battle was inevitable. No enemy ships were yet visible, but I trusted the First Sea Lord and waited for their imminent appearance. After making sure that the Commodore understood the situation, I immediately set off with my destroyers at the disposal of the cruiser squadron commander. As we moved away from the convoy and saw its vessels for the last time, our sailors were at battle stations. All guns, torpedo apparatuses, means of setting smoke screens were checked and ready for action. We had no doubt that there was a battle to be fought, I assumed that the strip of fog in the west to which the cruisers were rapidly approaching and is a hiding place for the enemy. Hobson, commander of the Aldersdale, attempted to contact Commodore or Broom to clarify whether he should remain with the escort ships, but was unsuccessful. This left the tanker alone, which was more than dangerous given its cargo. 
During the battle with the torpedo carriers, the Aldersdale's gunners earned the Commodore's praise. Damn good shooting, keep it up. The tanker now needed all her guns. Both submarines were ordered to operate independently. The cruisers swiftly turned westward and at 25 knots swept past the scattering convoy. Their departure was so unexpected that when the Valros, ejected half an hour ago, returned after completing its patrol, it found no ship of its own. Attempts to call the plane by radio were also unsuccessful. Palomares, in a state of full alert, was still following, along with several transports when a British seaplane approached them. The ships were already terribly fed up with the pestering attention of the German, a herring, which returned just in time to discover the disbanding of the convoy. Valros tried to contact the Palomares with a signal searchlight. Valros was circling the air defence ship when it became clear that the herring was approaching, making no secret of its intention to shoot down the small seaplane. Palomares opened fire, but the Valros was on his sights as he tried to evade the Germans. He transmitted, cease fire, and only the quick reaction of the men on the bridge of the air defence ship saved him. Herring hurriedly got away, and Valros managed to exchange messages with Palomares. The seaplane had too little gasoline left and could no longer catch up with the cruiser. So the Valros sat down next to the Palomares, the crew boarded, and the plane was taken in tow. Seeing a tiny seaplane hanging out behind the stern of an air defence ship was rather strange. Palomares was on the right flank of the convoy and therefore took a course to the southeast. The Poza Rica headed north. We, as well as the other escort ships, went to the area where icebergs were floating. At this time, six destroyers passed us. On board the Keppel, Captain Second Rank Broom addressed the crew. He said that no one wanted to abandon merchant ships, but the Admiralty received information that the Tirpitz with escort ships left Trondheim. Battleship, which had enormous firepower, could destroy the transports one by one, as long as enough shells. The task of cover cruisers and destroyers to intercept it. Admiral Hamilton did the same on the London when the cruisers turned west. By broadcast, he announced to the crew that the order had been received to disperse the convoy. Tirpitz, Hipper and several destroyers had left Trondheim and were probably approaching the convoy. London began to prepare for battle. On the destroyers of the flotilla Keppel sailors have long been at battle stations. They pulled on helmets and waited for the battle with German ships, which could bring posthumous glory. In the sick bay of the USS Fury, a surgeon coolly laid out gleaming instruments and bandages. Some time passed, however, and the masts of the enemy ships never appeared on the horizon. And then everyone realised that they are not necessarily rushing to meet the German fleet. This is nothing more than a tactical retreat. The feeling was extremely unpleasant, especially because behind the stern remained completely defenceless merchant ships, abandoned to their fate. On the bridge of Offa, everyone saw with what expression on his face the captain ordered to transmit to one of the air defence ships, May God be with you. And soon there was a quiet panic on the bridge. First Lieutenant W. D. O'Brien, first mate, recalls, The captain, the navigator, myself and several other officers were horrified to realise exactly what we were doing. We can't do this. We mustn't abandon the convoy. However, we did. Someone quite reasonably stated that there might be a tear pits lurking over the horizon, but it never appeared. We then discussed for quite a while whether to have a machine breakdown, stop the ship, wait for the others to disappear over the horizon, and then turn back to join the convoy. We almost didn't do that. I still blame myself for not pushing the captain harder that day. But then we consoled ourselves that our actions could not be completely aimless, Soon something new would be reported to us, and the enemy would appear. But no one reported anything, and the Germans never appeared. But the distance between us and the convoy was rapidly increasing. We all felt that we should turn back. It was the right moment to violate the order, and we will always be ashamed that we didn't do just that. The destroyers and cruisers continued their nightmarish run at full speed through the fog on a sea strewn with ice floes. Fast ships zigzagged to evade possible submarine attacks. 
but hunt-type escort destroyers like Wilton did not have much speed. They had great difficulty in keeping with us. At one point, the Wilton received an ironic signal from one of the cruisers, don't get cut in half. The monotonous Ledbury regretfully relayed, I feel like a kind of rotten Italians. Several hours passed, at which point the Ledburys requested permission to drop speed as its boilers were beginning to leak. Visibility at this time was poor and there was a lot of floating ice around. The men on the bridge were tensely looking into the darkness. They began to see unknown ships and icebergs. Nerves were strained to the limit. The squadron was still moving in close formation. Each ship towed a fog boy astern to avoid collisions. But even this was not helping. Suddenly an observer at the stern of the Keppel heard a multitude of voices. He lowered the binoculars with which he was trying to see something in the fog and discovered some black mass rolling out of the fog. It soon became clear that it was the port side of some large ship only a few feet away. The huge ship disappeared as quickly as it had appeared. The air was filled with the shrieks of sirens. Only some miracle prevented the London from ramming and sinking the Keppel. The flight of the cruisers continued and the mood of the sailors soured more and more as open text signals began to be received from the attacked transports, which were now far to the east. We are under attack by bombers. We are under attack by submarine. These reports were especially painful to the sailors of the destroyers. It was they, not the cruisers, who had to defend the transports to the last. It was they who had to fight the German planes and submarines. It was now clear that the tear pits was not going to attack the convoy. So who was wrong? Captain Second Rank Broom informed the Admiral that he was ready and could return. But it was too late. Admiral Hamilton relayed to all the ships. I know you are feeling as disappointed as we are because you have left it to the fine ships to make their own way to the harbour. The enemy, under cover of base air cover, has managed to amass a superior force in the area. We were therefore ordered to withdraw. We are very sorry that the splendid work of the escort destroyers was not completed. I am confident that we will soon get a chance to get even with the enemy. Aboard the American destroyer Wainwright, the mood was sombre. No one said it outright, but everyone realised that they had abandoned the convoy to its fate. Even when the destroyer returned to Valfjord and was credited with seven planes shot down, no one rejoiced, even though seven swastikas were painted on the trumpet for the number of victories. On the cruiser, Wichita sailors felt no better. From the intercepted radiograms, they knew very well how the events unfolded afterward and tried to find some excuse for themselves. In the ship's newspaper appeared a detailed report, printed when the cruiser was still going west. This issue appeared on July 5th, 1942, less than a day after the fateful order to disperse, and it was read by the entire crew of the cruiser. The report read, The first cruiser squadron consisting of the Wichita, Tuscaloosa, Norfolk and London under Admiral Hamilton was ordered to patrol alongside the PQ-17 convoy and act as a covering formation in case of surprise attack by enemy surface forces. Our instructions were very clear. We were not to go further than Medveji Island unless an enemy attack seemed imminent, and under no circumstances were we to cross the 25th meridian. The convoy was almost immediately detected by a Nazi reconnaissance plane. From the information that the command received from intelligences sources, it could be assumed that the enemy was indeed moving ships and aircraft northward. Since the last convoys had been conducted relatively successfully, the enemy was unlikely to intend to let us do it again. Aerial reconnaissance had been unable to observe German bases for several days because of bad weather. But about three days ago, the KVVS reported that all the main Nazi ships had left ports and were presumably heading north along the Norwegian coast under heavy air cover. Admiral Hamilton hoped we might have a chance to catch some of the pocket battleships and continued to cover PQ-17, coming in a few degrees east of the limit allowed by the order. The convoy was instructed to use thick fogs as cover, and so the course was laid out noticeably farther north than expected. To everyone's surprise, we covered the convoy until longitude 30 -0. When the attacks of enemy planes began, 
All the sailors of the cruiser squadron wanted to join the battle and help the transports. But our mission was made perfectly clear. If we rushed back to turn into air defence ships, we would expose ourselves to the risk of receiving an accidental torpedo or bomb hit. The resulting damage could have hampered the upcoming battle with enemy ships. It would have been a brave but strategically quite foolish move. After all, the convoy had a perfectly adequate direct escort that could well repel an attack by enemy aircraft and submarines. There was another practical consideration. Severe damage to a single cruiser would have more serious consequences than the loss of a dozen transports loaded to the brim. The loss of transports and their cargo could be made up for in a couple of months, but it would take at least two years to build a new modern cruiser. The recent loss of the cruisers Edinburgh and Trinidad, which were covering the Russian convoys, occurred precisely because of the misplaced desire to appear in the thick of battle. As a result, the Supreme Command decided not to further expose the covering forces to a similar danger, unless a reliable fighter cover. After briefly describing the events of July 4th, including the torpedo attack, the Wichita newspaper continues. Then came the startling news. Allied intelligence reports confirmed our suspicions. In reality, the situation was even worse than suspected. Under the cover of fog, all the heavy ships of the German fleet moved to northern Norway. To them should have been added hundreds of base aircraft, specially transferred there for this operation. A fresh squadron of submarines was on its way to the battle area. We had already gone much farther than the border where we were allowed to meet the enemy and farther than the extreme eastern point of the route. The enemy could get unlimited help from bombers and torpedo bombers operating from neighbouring airfields. We, for our part, had no forces to repel such an attack and the Russians were still too far away to help. A new large-scale air attack could be expected, so the convoy was ordered to disperse. The transports were to take various routes to Russia. They were to be assisted by Russian ships and airplanes. The main forces of our fleet were at some distance from the scene. Although the squadron had an aircraft carrier, even with it our total force was insufficient to cope with the planes, ships and submarines thrown against the convoy. German ships could operate at a considerable distance from the coast, but at the same time they were close enough to their airfields and could be constantly under cover of fighter planes. One of the main principles of military strategy says, if possible, meet the enemy at a place of your own choosing and concentrate superior forces against his weak point. If this is not possible, retreat to avoid falling into a trap. We were lucky and managed to avoid disastrous consequences. Finally, quoting Admiral Hamilton's radiogram, which stated, I am confident that in the very near future we will have a chance to settle accounts with the enemy in full, the Wichita paper concluded. We too are confident. None of us likes to retreat, but it must be remembered that we do not have all the information. No one dares accuse us of getting cold feet. Wainwright and Rowan have proved it. And yet their trials were only a faint hint of what might have happened. No one dares say that the English lacked courage. After all, they had been at war for almost three years. For a whole year they fought alone, without any allies, without a trained army without enough equipment. Their fleet was scattered all over the world's oceans. Anyone who has seen what the people of London, Liverpool, Bristol, Portsmouth, Coventry and Southampton experienced can attest to their bravery. Anyone who has seen the commandos in action who has been to Dunkirk and Malta can testify to it. And now we are brothers and allies to a greater degree than ever before. Our spirit and our goals will surely prevail. Our ships have gone much farther than they have been allowed to go in trying to lure the enemy to our fleet that would deal a decisive blow. We wish we could have done more, but war requires patience and cold reason as much as courage. We have only been playing this game for seven months. We're still full of energy and all we need is our chance, and maybe it will fall in the very near future. In the words of one of our signal callers, we're going to swat those sons of bitches we're going to smack them for sure. And now the cruiser follows southwest to Val Fjord, Iceland. Far behind the cruisers were 31 transports, 
They were all trying to sneak into Russian ports on their own, as were the ships of the immediate escort. Every man for himself. But after the initial surprise and annoyance had passed, we had a bad suspicion that persisted for several years afterwards. We could have been used as a piece of cheese in a mouse trap for the Germans. But for now, all we felt on Independence Day was dread. We were afraid that those who were lucky enough to be alive would not be able to justify themselves.